Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Leveraging Immunization Manager and Community-Based Organization Partnerships for COVID-19 and Beyond. The CDC Foundation Community COVID Coalition is so pleased to host this webinar in partnership with the Vaccine Equity Cooperative and Health Leads. This webinar is part of our ongoing commitment to support those of you working in communities and partnering with communities all across the country to fight this ongoing pandemic. I'm Julie Schofield and I will serve as today's moderator. Today's webinar is available in Spanish. To listen to this presentation in Spanish, click the globe interpretation icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We also have closed captioning options. To enable closed captioning, please click on the closed captioning icon on the bottom of your Zoom screen. We have a few uh, housekeep housekeeping items before we start our conversation. Uh, today's webinar will be recorded and it will be sent to everyone who registered along with all the slides and other materials that are referenced throughout our presentations. During today's webinar, we'll have time to answer a few questions. So please submit your questions using the Zoom Q&A button found on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our speakers will try to answer as many questions as possible along the way as well. You can use the Zoom chat feature to share comments, reactions, and links. And last but not least, at the end of the webinar, we will be launching a poll and evaluation survey. So please stick around to share your feedback on today's webinar and suggestions for future offerings. By way of just a little background, the Community COVID Coalition is a project of the CDC Foundation. Starting in June of 2020, our project focuses on behavior change communication, researching, message testing, and creating COVID-19 social media campaigns. Our current focus is on partnering with CBOs to reach the not yet vaccinated with messages designed to move them along a continuum from vaccine hesitancy to vaccine acceptance. We know CBOs are critical partners in this work and we're thrilled to bring you this webinar today. During the webinar, we'll review the role of immunization managers and programs in COVID-19 vaccine implementation, reinforce the value and impact of CBO partnerships with state and local health departments in the COVID-19 response, spotlight some successes and lessons learned from partnerships between CBOs and health departments in Oregon and Wisconsin, and offer some ideas for the future state of the relationships between immunization managers and community-based organizations. We have a great lineup of speakers for you today, including Charlie Grenade, public health analyst with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Immunization Services Division at the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases. She'll be followed by Claire Hannon, Executive Director of the Association of Immunization Managers, or AIM. Then we'll have two bright spot case studies. The first comes from Oregon and Rob Smith, Deputy Director of the Community Driven Vaccine Program at the Oregon Health Authority. He'll be joined by Kiana Angelo, founder and executive director at Living Islands, and Jespa Angelo, CIO and COO, also with Living Islands. Our final bright spot speaker is Laura Pokoko. She's the project manager with the Vaccination Community Outreach Program at the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. So on that note, let's get started with Charlie Grenade from the CDC. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to be here today to present to you all um, on a couple of slides overgoing our building partnerships, an overview of current activities and strategies to increase state and community collaboration. Next slide. So briefly, the agenda for today will be to uh, oh, provide an overview of our CDC funded partnership efforts followed by a review of additional resources developed to guide partner collaboration, and conclude with a proposal for future strategies for sustaining partnership efforts moving forward. Next slide, please. Next slide. 
So this slide here shows the key milestones for the US COVID-19 vaccination program. Beginning with persons at highest risk of transmission and severe outcomes, those including the elderly, healthcare workers, teachers, and other essential workers, and eventually open to all adults and children aged five and above, COVID-19 vaccines were distributed across the US at a rapid pace. And to date, 253 million people have received one or more doses, covering nearly 76% of the US population aged five years and older. And since today's presentations focus on collaboration with community-based organizations, I wanted to highlight the milestones in red here that reflect when supplemental funding was made available to the state immunization programs and their local health departments to support community engagement and other related activities contributing to these successes in the COVID-19 vaccination program. Next slide. So in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the United States Congress passed both the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act and the American Rescue Plan Act, both of 2021. And as a result, supplemental funding opportunities were made available to the existing core federal funding for state immunization program awardees. Of particular note were the following opportunities presented here. Starting with our COVID-19 supplement number three, Funding was provided to support the implementation and expansion of the COVID-19 vaccination program with special emphasis on high risk and underserved populations. Following that, additional funds were made available to help programs establish community partnerships to ensure greater equity and access to COVID-19 vaccines by those disproportionately affected. Finally, an addendum to the supplement number four was made available to assist immunization programs in the development and implementation of vaccine confidence strategies within their jurisdictions. Next slide. So a critical component of each of these funding opportunities was and is to support the immunization programs in engaging in additional partnerships, as well as to implement and evaluate new strategies to reach affected populations, such as those who may be vaccine hesitant, and individuals within racial and ethnic or other minority groups. As such, immunization programs were required to implement activities that were dependent on working with community-based organizations and partners, either directly or indirectly through their local health departments. Next slide, please. Through use of these supplemental funds, state and local immunization programs and health departments have been able to allocate funds directly to support community level strategies and activities to increase COVID-19 vaccine confidence and uptake. And this includes, but is not limited to, addressing mis- and disinformation, supporting webinars and town halls, coordinating speakers bureaus, and increasing access to vaccines and vaccination services. Next slide. And in addition to providing support to the 64 immunization program awardees, CDC intentionally partnered with state and national organizations to further reach local organizations and communities. The seeking to build the evidence base of effective interventions to improve vaccination coverage and to identify and implement strategies, the Partnering for Vaccine Equity Program, or PAVE, currently funds more than 400 state and national partners all of which can be found using the dashboard shown on this slide. And within the partner network, larger national partners participating in PAVE, such as CDC Foundation, Urban Institute, and Community Catalyst, also work to identify, reach, influence, and provide technical assistance and capacity support to the smaller organizations or CBOs they are supporting, and those who are working directly with the communities to Identify drivers of vaccine hesitancy. Next slide, please. Now, partnership efforts conducted by immunization programs at the state and local level are ongoing, yet many challenges remain, including addressing community mistrust of the government, reaching vulnerable populations, responding to limited program staffing capacity, vaccine access, issues with vaccine storage and handling, although we know there are many other issues as well. So over the next few slides, I will use some additional resources for immunization programs, as well as community partners that can be used to expand the coordination and collaboration with one another 
to help mitigate some of these observed barriers. Next slide, please. So the guide for developing, implementing, and monitoring community-driven strategies was developed by CDC to assist the immunization program awardees in expanding and or establishing community partnerships to build vaccine confidence and increase uptake among, among members of racial and ethnic minority communities. So by offering community partners a seat at the table, providing support to help implement strategies, and continuously engaging their knowledge, insights, and lived experiences as part of the planning and engagement, immunization programs and their local health departments can more effectively increase the vaccine confidence and uptake, ensuring health equity strategies are integrated throughout. On this slide, um, the guidance here outlines the five major steps necessary to identify and work with communities of focus within their jurisdictions. Next slide, please. Now, as we know, partnership work is bi-directional. Therefore, a complementary set of resources were developed specifically with community partners in mind. The first is a guide for community partners increasing COVID-19 vaccine uptake among racial and ethnic minority communities. And within this resource, there are potential strategies, interventions, and ready-made messages included, as well as information on who and how to connect with others on efforts to increase your COVID-19 vaccination confidence and access within your community. In addition to this, there's the best practices for community and faith-based organizations fact sheet, which includes communication materials and messaging, outreach strategies and use of trusted messengers, and information on how to address vaccine access issues. Next slide, please. So as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic response, state immunization programs and local health departments have established and or strengthened their community-based partnerships within their jurisdictions to increase COVID-19 vaccine confidence and uptake, an extraordinary effort that has thus far proven very successful. However, it is critical that efforts to maintain these partnerships are in place to ensure official relationships developed due to COVID are institutionalized to support routine immunity. Although the future landscape of partnership work is unknown, CDC is working to bridge the known communication and coordination gaps between the immunization program awardees and community level partners to help facilitate continued collaboration which includes the development of a partnership success framework or maturity model for immunization programs to use when establishing or maintaining partner networks. Additionally, opportunities to connect immunization programs and community-based partners um, operating within their jurisdictions are also underway. So this concludes my presentation. And again, I really thank you all for your time and attention. I'm happy to respond to any questions or entertain any comments in the chat as well at the end of this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Charlie. That was a great kickoff uh, presentation to get us started this afternoon. There's a lot of information uh, in a very short presentation. So I wanna remind everybody that uh, we are recording and we're gonna send you all the slides and uh, materials following uh, today's webinar. So be on the lookout for that. Next, I'm going to turn it over to Claire Hannon, the Executive Director of AIM, the Association of Immunization Managers. Um, thanks so much, Julie. And um, thanks to, to everyone, I guess, for getting on and for, for hosting this. Um, Charlie just gave a really great overview of what's coming from CDC and the guidance. I'm going to specifically focus on the funding that went from CDC to immunization programs that's available for CBOs and, and how to make that work. And I think it's important to understand what immunization programs are and the environment they're working in so that you can build a relationship with them. Um, so if you can go ahead to the next slide, a little bit about who we are, about who AIM is. Um, we basically represent the immunization programs. We're a membership nonprofit. Our members are in the 50 states, six major cities, and eight territories, the 64 jurisdictions that get funded by CDC to manage an immunization program. 
next slide. So a little bit about immunization programs. And basically, I'm going to refer to them as either immunization programs or awardees because they are the federally funded immunization programs in state health departments. But um, basically, they have certain requirements and responsibilities that come with the funding they receive from CDC. Uh, they manage the Vaccines for Children program. That's a federal entitlement program, but it is implemented at the state level. So they're enrolling private providers, they're managing inventory orders, doing training, everything that comes within that program. They're also doing outbreak control. Um, they're implementing strategies to increase coverage rates data collection, data analysis, tracking um, who's been vaccinated, identifying areas of need, doing education, promotion, communication. Um, and then of course, all of these activities on the COVID vaccine side as well. Next slide. Um, just to give you a sense of what an immunization program looks like, um, every state is different. Every jurisdiction is different. But um, in general, there are certain categories of the program or, or spaces that you should be aware of and familiar with. That VFC program is a big chunk of the staffing. You know, the orders, everything, provider enrollment, um, that Vaccines for Children program is a big column. Um, most other immunization programs will also have their data, their immunization information system, um, managing that data, the data quality, uh, provider onboarding, you know, working all, all aspects of the data. And then there's a third component that I label as health education. And that's where working with partnerships comes in. Um, they'll have health educators in this piece, adult coordinator, adolescent coordinator. This is traditionally the space that's been the least funded, um, but it has grown tremendously with COVID. Next slide. Um, another important thing to um, sort of understand about the environment right now is that the directors of the immunization programs in the states have high turnover and the staffing is spread very thin right now. Um, this just map shows the changeover since 2019 and more than half of immunization program managers are new since 2019, meaning that they've been leading the program in a time of COVID only, right? So they don't um, necessarily know what it was like to do the, the, the management during a routine uh, vaccination year. Next slide. Um, another thing I wanted to show about the environment um, with immunization programs is that their basic funding source, what we talked about um, receiving funding from CDC to support their program, that funding source, that base, funding source has been pretty level over the last 10 years. So that just means that as information technology, as their IIS, their data has grown, you know, their enhancements or things they've done to maintain their data systems, their staffing, you know, all of that they've had to do with the same amount of funding. And so they've been stretched very thin. They haven't been able to expand to do a lot of community work or adult work or work outside their core functions with the Vaccines for Children program. Um, just something to keep in mind. Next slide. So all of that really changed with COVID. Um, you know, the COVID vaccine was rolled out to basically all Americans. We still haven't reached all of the kids yet, but vaccinating all adults with two doses of COVID vaccine. Enormous undertaking. And we modeled it after VFC. So again, enrolling providers, this time enrolling adult providers, building a nationally connected data system. So being able to share data with CDC in real time and, and, and working on sharing it across state lines, working with limited supply of vaccine, the storage and handling, um, and also really trying to focus on equity and really being able to do that with improved data. So we did have improved data collection in enrolling adult providers and requiring them to report. So there's been a number of changes and improvements um, from, from the COVID vaccine rollout and also the supplemental funding that has come in working with community-based organizations. And that's really what I wanna get to. So next slide. 
Um, so that top line there is the base funding. That's the core funding I talked about that's been pretty level for 10 years. Um, Charlie went through some of the uh, supplemental funding that has come to immunization programs through COVID, and they're all listed here. Um, she also talked about the guidance that's come with each of these funding sources. And this chart, you can go back to it, has links to a lot of those guidance documents. When federal funding comes out, you know, it's not just a check. It always comes with guidance, with requirements, with reporting um, requirements. So there's a number of things that come along and those documents can be very helpful for you in understanding how to work um, with the immunization program or how to use this funding if it's available. Uh, next slide. I'm gonna focus on the supplemental four funding, which is the one that really works, um, supports immunization program work with community-based organizations. So it's over $3 billion to immunization programs, which is a huge amount of money compared to the funding they were receiving in their base grant for the last 10 years. It's July, 2020 through 2024. So this is this funding does currently sunset, um, but we really hope that the success of what's been going on with COVID will um, help incorporate this type of um, programmatic intervention and collaboration with community organizations into the future. Um, with this supplemental funding, 60% must be awarded to local health departments or CBOs. So it's specifically designed to go to community organizations. And 75% needs to be focused on improving equity. Um, Charlie went through some of the specific activities that it's funding, so I won't really go through them um, specifically. But again, you can look at that guidance and you can see it's everything from using data to increasing uptake, really addressing hesitancy and really addressing equity. Next slide. Um, I wanted to comment that immunization programs who are AIM members um, and AIM itself as an organization, we are committed to improving equity and vaccination. And I think that COVID has been um, a real challenge in that respect and also a real success in that we have had the data to recognize it and start doing strategies to address it. Um, our member assistance program is working with immunization programs to help them succeed in this area, to help them come up with work plans, working with communities and implement them, work with each other to address challenges. And so all of that just speaks to our commitment and the immunization program commitment to work with community organizations like you. The vaccine confidence really depends on community engagement. I think this has been recognized and um, it's just an opportunity to do this. Uh, and COVID vaccination has provided this opportunity to expand and engage partnerships. And again, hopefully that's gonna continue out into the future. Um, next slide. So looking ahead and, you know, just if we're looking, if I'm telling you about these opportunities with community-based organizations, um, I just want to emphasize that, again, even though the supplemental funding ends in 2024, the programmatic um, expansion into COVID, the data collection allowing us to focus more on equity, the hesitancy that's happening, you know, this stuff isn't going away. And there's going to be more programmatic emphasis on the data, on equity. Um, we will be at some point, I guess, you know, hopefully incorporating COVID into routine activities. Um, there's always an active legislative environment. And so that really needs community trusted voices um, to make a difference there. Um, expansion of the adult infrastructure. Again, all of those providers that have been enrolled for the adult COVID, you know, we hope to tap into that for routine activities moving forward. Um, and again, continuously addressing vaccine confidence and, and trust. All of these things point to the critical need to have strong partnerships between immunization programs and CBOs. Next slide. So how do we make that happen? How do you um, get in on this action? Um, well, I think it's important to build a relationship with the state and local immunization program, participate in any activities they're doing. Many of them will have webinars. Um, you know, they'll have training programs, go on their website, look into that. 
Um, look at the guidance that came out from CDC, the guidance around these supplemental activities, how they're being told to engage with community groups and make sure that you can respond to, the, in, in, to them. You know, you can clearly articulate your population, the geographic location you serve, um, demonstrate capacity. All of these, these funds come with reporting requirements. So if you can clearly show you know, what you're doing and be able to meet those reporting requirements, help the immunization program meet them, that's really a plus. Meet the reporting and data requirements. Um, and so in order to help you do that, you know, we are a resource for you, AIM, um, we love to continue to partner and, and make more strong relationships between communities and immunization programs. We have the program manager list um, for all the jurisdictions on our website, and we've also put together a, a few resources about how to better partner and collaborate in this area, and those um, handouts are on our website as well. Um, so I'm really happy to give you this sort of overview, and we're going to have two great examples of real life collaborations um, coming up. Next slide. I think I might just have a thank you slide. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Claire. Um, that's just amazing. And you, you put the two presentations from CDC and yours together, and I think you begin to really paint a picture of how we've moved mountains in the last year around COVID vaccination. And I've heard CDC state that the immunization programs have accomplished in one year what they routinely would have done in about seven years under the former just vaccine for children program. So, you know, hats off to all the immunization managers and programs out there who have done such an amazing job at uh, moving this system and developing these systems. So now we're going to drill down even further and take our conversation to the state level where I'm happy to have the state of Oregon represented by Rob Smith and then his partners with Living Islands, Kiana Angelo and Jessica Angelo. So I'm gonna invite y'all to come on screen and tell us what's going on out there in Oregon. Thanks, Julie. I'm really, really pleased about the opportunity to share about our program and to get one of our partners an opportunity to share about their program, Living Islands. Um, as mentioned, my name is Rob Smith. I'm the deputy director for the Vaccine Operations Team Equity, otherwise known as VOTE. Um, we are a part of the COVID Response and Recovery Unit, which is actually a joint effort between the Oregon Health Authority and the Oregon Department of Human Services. Um, if you all will bear with me for just one second, I'm going to give a visual description, which we uh, try to provide as a best practice for folks who might have visual disabilities or impairments during video uh, meetings like this. Uh, so. Uh, he, him, his pronouns, Rob Smith. I'm a white male with salt and pepper hair and salt and pepper beard. I'm wearing uh, kind of like a, a purple sweater with a collared shirt underneath it. And my background is blurred. Uh, next slide, please. I also just wanna take a moment and uh, provide OHA's acknowledgement to community. Uh, we acknowledge that there are institutional, systemic and structural barriers that perpetuate inequity that have silenced the voices of community over time. We recognize that community, we recognize community engaged health improvement is a long term and adapting process. We are striving to engage with communities through deliberate, structured, emerging, and best practice processes. Next slide, please. Just to give a bit of an overview on, on what we do uh, through VOTE, uh, VOTE collaborates locally to create vaccine, vaccine solutions with Oregon communities disproportionately impacted by COVID. Uh, we provide up to $300,000 to community-based organizations that have uh, approached us and expressed interest in creating vaccine opportunities in their communities. Right now we're working with about uh, 176 partners 125 vaccine events are currently in the planning stages, and we've completed over 677, uh, well, we've supported, sorry, I should say, 677 events since we started doing this work in April-ish of last year. Um, one of our strategies is to purposefully try to partner with uh, what would be considered sort of non-traditional CBOs. So, uh, you know, OHA has a long history of working with nonprofits, 
Um, in this work, we recognize that there are communities that are being underserved. And in order to reach those communities, we might approach places that we haven't traditionally worked with, uh, places like, for example, cultural grocery stores, uh, cultural faith centers, um, and ask them if they were interested in, in working with us. And we found a lot of success in that approach. Uh, we provide matchmaking with our CBOs for events and support partnership among community leaders. We also magnify existing efforts. One of our, our key strategies is also to not stand in the way of any uh, local efforts that were occurring. So we really try to supplement, magnify events that were already occurring through partnerships with the local public health authorities or partnerships that just had been created by the CBOs themselves. Our team, uh, we have regional folks known as vaccine engagement coordinators, and they have sort of regions assigned throughout the state as well as specific populations they might be specialized in working with. And um, each of them provides that support, uh, sort of hands-on support with our CBO partners, uh, just to, to sort of get out of the way, let them sort of lead and, and give us their vision for what that might look like. Uh, and then provide them resources along the way. And I also did want to mention, um, you know, we are doing this in partnership with other OHA teams that are sort of regionally based um, that were already sort of doing foundational work around COVID-19 before vaccine came along. And we, we couldn't be nearly as successful as we have been without that foundational work of those folks working with the CBOs already. So we, we do this in concert with a lot of other teams that, are, that deserve a lot of thank you. Next slide, please. So uh, the general scope of activities that we support with our CBOs, uh, one, and this is probably the, the biggest one, is uh, CBOs can host or co-host a vaccine event. That could be a, a vaccination event or an event to provide information about the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, folks can uh, offer to provide staff or volunteers to existing events. So if they didn't have capacity to create an event themselves, they might actually send staff or volunteers to help someone else sort of plus up their event in order to make it more successful. Uh, folks, our CBOs can provide uh, outreach about existing events. So help us promote the events in the communities they serve. And they can also provide uh, transportation or registration support. So either helping folks get to vaccine events that may be nearby or, or folks that might have transportation challenges or they can help people register for existing vaccine appointments. And all of these activities are reimbursable through our grant program. Next slide, please. Some additional resources, or I guess a little bit more detail about the resources that are available to our CBOs. Uh, we provide funding not only for future planned events, but actually past events. Our grant program uh, goes back to December 1st of 2020. Uh, we just sort of recognized that a lot of folks had been already sort of in the planning stages and done a lot of extra work on top of the work they already have as CBOs to set up these events. And there wasn't funding reimbursement available for them at the time. So we wanted to make sure that folks were getting compensated for the work that they had done before our program even came into existence. Uh, so, and, and that includes uh, ex of course, events that we had nothing to do with at the time, we still want to reimburse them for their time and expenses. Uh, we can help provide food boxes, um, accessibility kits, which includes things like magnifying glasses um, in order to help folks that might have um, impairments or disabilities understand or be able to um, be able to navigate vaccine events better. Uh, we can help connect CBOs with interpretation services and with COVID testing that could be offered in concurrent to vaccine at the events. We can offer uh, additional canvassing, marketing, communication tools, um, helping folks get the information about their event out. And we also connect folks to our Get Vaccinated, get vaccinated Oregon tool, which is how the majority of Oregonians might find out about vaccine events that are happening in their area. So we can actually get the CBOs events listed on that, um, on that register um, if they want uh, in order to help people find their vaccine events. As mentioned, we have other OHA teams that are also working on wraparound services around COVID. So we work very closely with them. If there are other needs presenting by the CBOs, uh, we can get them connected to resources around that as well. Next slide. 
Um, just a little bit about the matchmaking process. Um, we call it matchmaking because essentially the CBO comes to us and says, here's what we wanna do, here's what we need. And our team is really responsible of trying to find and locate those resources. So that could be a vaccinator, um, that could be those, those aforementioned food boxes or the variety of other resources that I've mentioned. Um, we start with our lo local public health authority, just recognizing um, the va and valuing the partnership that we have with those organizations throughout the state. Um, they would sort of get the first right to uh, partner with these CBOs if it was appropriate. Um, and then from there, if the local public health authority isn't able to provide vaccinators for that event, we'll go through sort of a list of other possible vaccinators. So places like pharmacies, uh, health systems, hospitals, clinics, FQHCs, um, you know, whatever is the best fit, you know, by the partner's estimation for the population that's being worked on, that's who we first try to approach. And if we're not able to find that first option, we will continue working with the partner until we find uh, a vaccinator that does work. Um, I mentioned before vaccine confidence events. So not all of the vaccine events that we set up are, are actual vaccine and arm events. Um, folks can also set up events to answer questions about vaccine. Um, we will check in with a partner to see if they have an event space available. If not, we'll try to find one with, with them. Um, if there are specific language or cultural needs, or if there are other state agencies that are already partnering with them, we'll just make sure that we're communicating with everyone uh, in order to make sure it's a, it's a well-formed partnership. And as mentioned also, we can connect people to other resources like SNAP or Medicaid if needed. Next slide, please. Um, once the event is about ready to be executed, um, we'll ensure that the advertising happens if the, if the partner wants the event to be advertised. Um, we'll support any other needs the partner might have. After the event, uh, we'll help them evaluate the event success. Using some lessons learned, we might prepare for additional, um, additional events if the partner's interested in doing that, and then we'll support them in, in executing those events going forward. Next slide. And now I think we can hear from our partners at Living Islands. Thank you. Yakwe Alap, meaning hello everyone in Marshallese. My name is Kiana Judah Angelo, Executive Director and Founder of Living Islands. And I'm Jesper Angelo, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Living Islands. And together we created Living Islands Nonprofit. Next slide, please. Living Islands is a networking and educational nonprofit serving the Micronesian people. Because of the pandemic, we expanded our mission to serve all Pacific Islander nations in the state of Oregon. Next slide. The Pacific Islands has become the, became the population group with the highest infection rate in the U.S. In the spring of 2020, Pacific Islands and Oregon had the highest rate of COVID per capita compared with any other state, more than three times the rate of white or Caucasian Oregonians. All projects for us at this point became focused on the pandemic. We had to reset, rethink, and reorganize our work. Starting from scratch, we really had to listen to our community's needs. We were able to bring those stories of hardship and struggle to our corporate partners and county leaders. With their help, we were able to get Pacific Islander vaccine test sites up and running in June of 2020. This is our immediate community needs. However, next slide, please. We didn't address what the community wanted. We needed to rethink how we address these needs in a cultural sensitive way. Part of that cultural understanding was actively listening to our community members and finding out one of the biggest requests was food that they could relate to. We came up with culturally specific food and resource drive throughs in the fall of 2020. This brought hope to our communities. It was incredibly popular and allowed us to engage much better with our community. Next slide. After the test sites, we knew the community needed more incentive to show up. We also knew that our food drives became the best way to reach our community members. So we decided to combine the food drives with vaccination education and the option of being vaccinated. 
It's not every day that you go get vaccinated and go home with parrotfish and lots of coconuts. We also enlisted our Pacific Islander politicians, community leaders, and church leaders to help with vaccine education. It worked, and it worked so well that we figured out this was a good way to also distribute other resources as well. We connected and partnered with our Pacific Islander CBOs. We provided COVID material, PPE, gift cards, emergency dental services, and so much more. Our latest vaccination site has food for around 2,000 community members. We had hot plates of Pacific Islander meals for everybody showing up. And we ended up vaccinating around 300 people at that event. Next slide, please. So talking to our community at these food drives taught us that we had to rethink how we do messaging. For example, the government mandated us back then that we could only be with our family members. In the minds of a Pacific Islanders, the definition of family could mean up to 100 people or more. We knew that all of our messaging needed to be culturally specific. So in the late spring of 2021, we decided that we needed Pacific Islander driven media. We needed videos and materials in Pacific Island languages. We needed messaging that was relevant to each of our community members. Storytelling by Pacific Islanders for Pacific Islanders. So we were lucky and with the help of private funders and with help from OHA, Oregon Health Authority, we acquired professional equipment. And we're making commercial grade PSAs, averaging 30,000 per use. Please. So moving forward, here's something we learned along the way. Understand your community's cultural background. So trust your CBOs. Listen to your community needs and their wants. And the needs change constantly. So be prepared to adjust how you help the community along the way. Surveys for BIPOC communities should always include a DEI lenses and provide more support and funding for workshops on emergency preparedness and disaster relief programs. Next slide, please. So in the end, we found out that it truly does take a village. We wouldn't have been able to do all, any of our work without support from our corporate partners, our community partners that we listed here. The success of getting our Pacific Islander communities vaccinated was largely due to the funding and the support of Oregon Health Authority Boat Team. Como tara, meaning thank you for being part of our village. Thank you very much to Rob and Kiana and Yespa for telling an amazing story of partnership, how you have come to work together. And I think some of the amazing work that you're doing at uh, Living Islands to reach a very specific community that needed your services. So we're going to turn to our final Bright Spot uh, case study this afternoon and have Laura Kokopal uh, from the Wisconsin uh, Department of Health Services give us our final conversation about partnerships. All right, thank you, Julie. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be able to speak with you all today about our vaccination community outreach program here in Wisconsin. Um, as Julie said, my name is Laura Kokopal, and I am a project manager and coordinator for the vaccination community outreach grant program in the COVID-19 response and recovery team at the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. Also on the call with me is Stephanie Schauer, our immunization section chief in our Bureau of Communicable Diseases and the program manager for our immunization grant. Next slide, please. I will start with an overview of the program, followed by the populations that we serve and the activities conducted through the grant. I'll also cover some success stories, as well as the challenges and barriers experienced by our awardees in implementing their projects. Then I'll wrap up with some lessons learned and some parting advice. Next slide, please. Our vaccination community outreach grant program is funded through the CDC COVID-19 supplemental funds. These were awarded to the Wisconsin Department of Health Services and are managed in the Bureau of Communicable Diseases. 
In Wisconsin, we have a separate COVID-19 response and recovery team through which the Vaccination Community Outreach Grant Program is managed. And of course, we continue to work closely with the Bureau on Program Administration. Next slide, please. The Vaccination Community Outreach Grant was created in response to the concerning inequities we were seeing in COVID-19 vaccine uptake in Wisconsin. The purpose was to partner with community level organizations as trusted messengers across the state, working with marginalized and medically underserved populations to address inequities in access to the COVID-19 vaccine, limited access to accurate vaccine information and resources, as well as the prevalent low vaccine confidence in these communities. Next slide, please. We first launched the request for applications in February of 2021. Um, we completed our first round of this program from April through October of that year. Next slide, please. Due to the success of the program, the decision was made to continue the good work across the state for a second round. We launched the request for applications that month with three application rounds. Our second round of awardees began their projects in November, December, and at, just at the beginning of this month, um, and will continue through October of 2022. Next slide, please. Through our first round of this grant, we were able to award $6.3 million to 101 community level organizations. In our second round, we have been able to award $11.6 million to 135 community level organizations. Of these, 64% are returning and 36% are new partners. These organizations include federally qualified health centers, school districts, local and tribal health departments, and community-based organizations. On the right, you can see the number of projects that worked in each county across the state in our first round with the highest concentration around the cities of Milwaukee and Madison there in darker purple. Next slide, please. Many marginalized and medically underserved populations were served through this project, including many racial and ethnic groups in our state, farm workers, immigrants and refugees, individuals who are houseless, and individuals with disabilities. You can see the full list of standardized categories here, and you can see it is quite long. Next slide, please. Now I am going to share with you some results from our first round of this program, uh, running from April through October. During that round, this program supported over 4,000 vaccination events, administering over 131,000 vaccinations. Over 24,000 education events were held and nearly 3 trillion ad posts with trillions of impressions. Next slide, please. We had many excellent success stories through this program, um, but I'll only highlight a couple for you here. Uh, so Sherman Park Community Association in Milwaukee started their project with a goal of reaching 5,000 households through their door-to-door -door canvassing and were able to reach over 8,000 households through this grant. The Hmong Institute was able to vaccinate over 400 Hmong and Southeast Asian elders and adults through their mobile clinic who would not otherwise have been able to get vaccinated due to their lack of computer skills and or lack of language, um, lack of English language skills. Next slide, please. Of course, these successes didn't come without challenges or barriers. Um, when asked about the challenges to project implementation, over 60 organizations reported low vaccine confidence as a barrier to their work. Um, this was followed by difficulties hiring qualified and bilingual staff for the short-term project. Next slide, please. Looking more closely at vaccine confidence and misinformation, a lack of access to accurate information on vaccines, due to language or technology barriers was the most commonly reported driver. A lack of trust in the government and health systems and concerns about long-term side effects were also commonly reported drivers of misinformation and low vaccine confidence. Next slide, please. When asked about barriers to vaccine access and uptake in their communities, most reported a lack of transportation or mobility as a barrier um, and this was followed again by low vaccine confidence as well. Next slide, please. To overcome these challenges and barriers, awardees had two primary pieces of advice. The first was to utilize and build on trusted relationships in the community. Oshkosh Area School District found that their pre-existing relationships with families in their community and their pre-existing status as a trusted organization 
was invaluable in implementing the project and running a successful vaccination event. Wisconsin Literacy focused more on one-to-one -one conversations in their project and found that in addition to sharing personal experiences with the vaccine, these were the most effective strategies in communicating vaccine information and improving vaccine confidence in the communities that they served. Next slide, please. The second piece of advice was to physically go to the population you are trying to serve and not expect them to come to you. Partnership Community Health Center ran a series of mobile vaccination clinics through their project at a number of community sites for underserved populations, such as methadone clinics and trailer park communities. They found building trusted relationships to be critical and that physically showing up in these areas helped to build that trust. Kenosha County Public Health conducted door-to-door -door vaccinations and block-by-block -block vaccination events. Uh, and they did this in close partnership with neighborhood leaders. Uh, through this effort, they quickly became a popular and trusted organization uh, in these communities. Next slide, please. Across all projects, one-on-one -on -one conversations and tailored advertisements were the most effective strategies reported. And this was followed by leveraging local trusted partners and participating in community events. Next slide, please. And I'll conclude all of this with some advice for community-based organizations on this call um, that are hoping to form partnerships with public health outside of a grant program. I would always recommend reaching out and asking what partnership opportunities may be possible. All state public health system, systems are organized a little differently. So depending on your local structure and the geographic range of your project, you may choose to pursue a partnership at the city, county, regional, or state level, or all of the above. It is not a foregone conclusion that state public health department will be the best fit for your project. Many of our organizations working in Milwaukee in particular um, work very closely with the city public health department there. Our juris all jurisdictions will have several public numbers that are available for a cold call um, if needed. If your jurisdiction has a team dedicated to health equity or external partnerships, this will be the team you want to get in contact with. If not, um, the emergency or COVID response teams may be where you need to go, again, depending on what type of project you are trying to implement. Alternatively, um, as with everything, networking is your best bet. If you know another organization that partners with the state or local health department, see if they would be willing to make an introduction, and that could be a good way to get in the door. However you choose to do it, please do not be intimidated to reach out and form that connection. After all, we are here to serve the public. Next slide, please. Finally, I would like to acknowledge all of the incredible people who have been involved with this program, especially Melanie Schmidt, our director at the COVID-19 response and recovery team, Stephanie Schauer, of course, for her invaluable support and guidance, Diamond Hansen, my supervisor and lead for the outreach team and the COVID-19 response and recovery team, as well as the amazing teams for the vaccination committee outreach grant, both current and former for all of their work on this effort. And of course, I can't forget our data analysts for the fantastic mapping and qualitative analysis that was presented here today. Thank you all, and I'll turn it back to Julie. Thank you, Laura. That was a fantastic closing presentation. And if all of our speakers would be on standby here and maybe unmute and come back on for just a moment, we do have oh, just a minute or two for a question or two. And Laura, we actually got one for you. Um, someone has asked whether or not you can speak a little more about the one-on-one -on -one outreach and how it was executed and supported. So um, a lot of the organizations did one-on-one -on -one outreach either through door-to-door -door vaccination um, or they did door-to-door -door education events as well. Uh, many also were at made themselves a regular presence at local organizations uh, with a booth or some sort of um, setup and then had these one-on-one -on -one conversations with the public about vaccine confidence issues. And they did find that in general, as opposed to education events or ads or some of these other uh, more public or larger group events, that if you were really dealing with communities with significant lack of vaccine confidence, these one-on-one -on -one conversations were really what was needed, sometimes multiple one-on-one -on -one conversations. 
in order to um, turn that person's opinion around and get them to where they need to be in order to feel comfortable getting vaccinated. So it, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. And Rob, we had a question for you. If you could uh, talk a little more about the accessibility kits and, and what were in them. Sure, yeah. Um, accessibility kits were a project of another teams, but they included things like, I've got the list here, pocket talker amplifiers, batteries, clear masks. So if folks needed to see lips, uh, they could see lips, small whiteboards, flashlights, magnifying glasses, visual communication cards, so in general, just a variety of items to help folks navigate if they had any type of disability or impairment, um, we wanted to try to support them in being able to navigate the vaccine event better. Great, thank you. So I think we're rounding out our time here. And so I'm gonna to turn to our speakers and ask if anybody has any sort of last words of wisdom for our community-based organizations and partners who are on the line with us today in terms of, you know, what is that one nugget of advice you would give them for how to really approach the health department, how to work on partnerships? And so, uh, Charlie, can I, can I ask you for, to go first? Absolutely. And um, my major piece of advice is just to keep trying. I know we've heard from a lot of partners that it's really difficult to get the attention of your local health departments or your state immunization programs. And, you know, understanding that that's frustrating, but they are very busy, but just keep at it. Just, you know, reach out to whoever you can in your immunization programs at all levels and just keep knocking on that door. Um, someone will answer, I promise. And just know that on our end, you know, we will be working with the programs to help them be a little bit more reactive and responsive to those as well. Because, you know, uh, in listening to both sides, you all have a lot of the same challenges. So. We really want to make sure that everyone's talking to each other because you all are working towards the same goals. Thank you for that. Kiana and Jesper, if you're still there, you know, you did an amazing job pivoting early in the pandemic from services you were providing to becoming all COVID all, all the time. As a community-based organization, what would you say to your colleagues in other communities across the country of how to go about uh, reaching out to your uh, health department? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, excuse us. Um, well, we, we've had some challenges um, in our communities that a lot of our community members didn't have or hold a 501c3. Um, and a lot of our Pacific Islanders were um, church-based uh, affiliation helping their own community members. So we encouraged them to partner with us and then we would have to speak on their behalf um, and then also do introductions to Oregon Health Authority and let them know that they are not, um, they're not scary to talk to because a lot of yes. people think about the government, it is really hard to make a relationship and it, the government officials are always very serious, which is good, but we also have community members who are who never had that opportunity or know how how to right. so just kind of being there for them um cbo's kind of reaching out to those sub communities if that makes sense great thank you for that um we're going to launch our survey now so for those of you who are still on the webinar please stick around and answer these survey questions i think we're going to wrap here i got we've got one minute i think till the close of the hour I first want to thank my team at the Community COVID Coalition, the CDC Foundation. Uh, certainly want to support our, our, or thank our friends at Health Leads and the Vaccine Equity Cooperative. To our fantastic lineup of speakers today, thank you. And then I've got to give a special shout out as we close out our program today to all the health department folks at state and local levels, the immunization programs who have really moved mountains uh, to deliver COVID-19 vaccines over the last year, and to all the community-based partners who have had to pivot, who have had to learn new skills, who have had to roll up their sleeves and really help bridge gaps between health departments and the communities that we all need and want to serve. So a giant thank you to everyone 
final reminder, we are going to send the recording and the slides and these reference materials out to everyone following the close of our webinar today. So take a moment, finish the survey, and thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon.